Hello and welcome. We are extremely privileged today to be speaking with Stephen Levy. He is editor-at-large at Wired. He has, he's a serial author. He's been writing about artificial intelligence and technology for decades now. He has a perspective on AI that many of us wish that we had. His latest book is Facebook, The Inside Story. Uh, Stephen Levy, thank you very, very much for joining us. Thank you. I wanted to, to start out with that, that historical view. You've seen artificial intelligence in, uh, in several of its waves, uh, from the good old-fashioned AI of, uh, of the 90s and before, uh, and now to today. Could you speak a little bit about well, how is it different? How is it similar? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I first started writing about technology in the early 1980s, I found myself at MIT's AI lab, and I met Marvin Minsky, who was one of the founding fathers of AI. And um, in my first book, Hackers, I wound up talking to not only a lot of people who worked in the lab, but Minsky and John McCarthy, who was another one of the people who, you know, McCarthy himself actually invented the term artificial intelligence. And back at that point, they really felt that they were, within just a few years of making computers, that would be as smart as human beings. Um, and that whole pursuit uh, slowed, the computers weren't powerful enough, and the model really wasn't working to try to uh, emulate human reasoning and program that into a computer. Um, by the 90s, people were trying something different. And I did a book called Artificial Life, where I talked about trying to get intelligence to emerge from rules within the computer in sort of a biological sense. And that actually got some traction. The AI lab at MIT uh, switched to a more uh, emergent you know, mode where they tried to do, say, insect intelligence. And that's why uh, the Roomba was a direct result of that approach which came out of that lab. But it really wasn't until the mid-2000s that we got that big jump with neural networks and deep learning that came from Toronto. And during the 2010s, that approach, that machine learning uh, neural net approach turned out to be terrifically effective. And one by one, uh, the big companies began to integrate it into their products. And so Google, uh, at a certain point, turned over its search engine to that new mode. And finally, we had this second boost you know, kind of like the afterburners turned on um, in 2017 when people came up with the idea of transformers, which was a way to supercharge those neural nets and launch the large language models we're seeing today, um, which are so effective that the people who build them uh, are astounded by how well they work. Oh, indeed. I guess I'm curious your thoughts on the degree to which what we're seeing right right now is also a bit of a sociological phenomenon as much as it is a technological phenomenon in that I mean, we've had transformers for a couple of years now. People have done incredible things on the natural language understanding side of things. But it was really with ChatGPT when um, everything went, went wild, when every, it, it really brought to everyone's attention that, my goodness, these things are incredible. They have all these capabilities. Uh, this is real in a different way, and all of a sudden, everyone from executives to family members are all talking about this. Is there an element whereby this attention and focus on, and this experience that, that OpenAI created is a catalyst to additional development and um, uh, that could propel this in a way that it could have also just sat in the corner and be useful but not society changing? Well, there's a couple elements to that. Uh, for one thing, the idea that it speaks our language and does it so well resonates with people who are totally non-technical um, and we anthropomorphize. And when we get something that speaks to us so uh, proficiently, then we're going to think that uh, we reach the higher level here, and that you know there, there's something going on there that maybe isn't going on at all, but creates the illusion of it. Um, uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, Google fired one of its researchers um, named Blake Lemoyne because he insisted that its large language model was sentient. And they said, that's ridiculous. Uh, we can't have this person running around saying that. And they got rid of him. I've talked a lot to Blake, and 
I'm not 100% sure, really, that this whole wasn't sort of a performance, you know, uh, performance art for him because uh, he just wanted to mm -hmm. underline some of the dangers and, you know, uh, the issues that we would work with. He insists that he's totally convinced that the AI is sentient, but at a certain point, it doesn't matter if it really behaves as sentient. And of course, it's not just like a human being, but it does things that no humans can do because it can take in billions and billions and billions of data points and you know all sorts of content, all the books ever written, et cetera, et cetera, and, and synthesize that and spit back something pretty coherent within seconds, which is something that people can't do. So we have not only something that people can relate to, but it's something that seems of bottomless intellect and knowledge that uh, impresses us no end, even if some of the stuff is made up. No, indeed. Well, it's often struck me that, uh, well, so I don't think any of us or most folks would view that any of these models have the capability for sentience. Whether or not that will come is a, is a, very, a very open question. But what it struck me is that um, it does provide a mirror on ourselves. And it makes, at least for me, question so many of the aut autonomous behaviors that I have, so much of what I do on a regular mm. basis, looks like I don't need a whole lot of sentience for. Much of my behavior, much of what I attribute to intelligence, might not actually be that intelligent, and there are only certain times when I'm turning on these other systems mentally. I guess I'm curious whether or not this is also sort of revealing a lot about ourselves as humans and potentially our flaws as humans, that much like a model hallucinates, Arguably, we hallucinate all the time, and um, in the positive sense, we call that creativity. On the negative sense, we call that um, amnesia, memory Lies. loss, or, uh, <laughs> or, or, or delusion. Um, are you seeing folks look at that and say, well, we're, we're getting to a better understanding of so what is actually intelligence? You know, since the very beginning, AI has been seen as something to reflect what intelligence is and, and what humans consider intelligence. And you know, uh, when it didn't work, people would say, well, at least we're getting a better idea of you know, what, what we talk about when we talk about intelligence and where it falls short is telling. Um, and I think uh, that's never more relevant than now. Um, so you're absolutely right that sometimes we're asking things of our AI that we don't expect of ourselves. So when we talk about, oh my God, these things are biased, we've got to get rid of the bias. <laughs> well, that bias comes from us. The, the AI, the you know, kind of large language models, are trained on what humans do, and they're a mirror for the you know, super unfortunate bias that humans have. Um, and when it comes to misinformation, a, a big fear that people say is, well, these things are going to be the, an unbelievable server of misinformation. Well, that's what Facebook is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, or various unnamed politicians. Yeah, um, yeah, mm. yeah. So it's sort of virtual George Santos, mm. you know, to churn out make-believe stuff. Um, these things are programmed to give us what we want to hear. And you know, it's just being helpful to say, uh, gee, this person is asking for something. I don't know the answer, so I'm going to come up with the most likely possibility that that happened. When I um, used uh, my own name in there, and you know, like a lot of people, I say, write an obituary for Stephen Levy. Ooh. And you know, and it's very and morbid. Some things that got ripe, and then it gave me an award for something that I didn't win the award and it gave me an award for something I didn't write about, but I could have written about, right? So they said, I said I won a National Magazine Award for writing about the dot-com bust. Well, I wrote about the dot-com bust. I didn't win a National Magazine Award for it. I won a different award for writing about something else, but it, you know, close enough, I guess. Well, I guess the, the positive way of viewing this is that maybe these are things that you should have, you should have written about or, should have, or awards that actually you should have positioned for, or that there are these opportunities that you could have gone that would have been consistent with this, that 
Uh, well, the, the model if would. If I had only known. Right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, certainly when it comes to holding these models to a double standard, it's often struck me that, I mean, if we think that these models are transparent, and arguably in a technical sense, they're fully transparent, but have you, have you tried people? Uh, our ability to go right. in and understand our own thought processes, let alone um, uh, have credible explanations for what our thought processes are, are very limited. Are you sure they're transparent? I think we have a, a difficulty in coming up you know, and deconstructing with exactly what they do come up with. There's sort of a black box aspect to the output of these things. Mm. You know, we know how we train them. We can retrace those steps. But uh, I think even the best scientists aren't 100% sure how to decode that and to say, oh, this is the twist that made the, you know, uh, Sydney uh, go off the rails uh, and make up something or fall in love with its, mm. you know, uh, Questioner. Well, there's the difference between transparency versus intuitiveness or explainability of it. And yeah, so I would say that it, it's, it's very transparent, it's just we have no idea what that means. Right. Uh, and some of this ties to the, to the patterns that we're asking to predict. Um, it's sort of for any sufficiently complex pattern that you're looking to predict, arguably the, the, the solution to it is, is going to be very unintuitive. Um, much in the same way that we're making decisions around, do I like this piece of art? Do I like the, the I, do I like this food that I'm that I'm eating? What made me say these particular things? I can well, it'd be very difficult to come up with both an intuitive and accurate description of what it was that uh, that went into that. And and here's the enticing thing about these things uh, is it's only through I believe uh, AI that we're going to get the answers to those questions you pose. Mm -hmm. You know, we are you know, in the dark when it comes to how the brain works mm -hmm. and how that dance between free will and determinism works. Uh, and maybe this super large models that are able to take in a lot of information and process it are going to give us clues to what we haven't been able to crack so far. So for all the dangers people talk about, there's big benefits in developing these models and using them to solve the seemingly intractable problems that humans have been grappling with for centuries. Yes, yeah, so you would think that it'd be an absolutely wonderful time to be a neuroscientist, but uh, I, I haven't spoken with any of them. I could imagine they might also be very, very frustrated that... <laughs> well, I don't know. I, uh, I think that a lot of neuroscientists are pretty excited about mm -hmm. collaborating with uh, a lot of these AI models uh, to help them get farther along in what they're doing. Absolutely. Uh, that and I think we probably all have a lot of debt to acknowledge to, to them for many of the, the methods and techniques that we have in, uh, when it comes to neural networks. I think a lot of the early research was pioneered by them. Uh, I'd like to switch focuses now in terms of our, our use of these. Um, and you've written about Apple and Google and Facebook, and obviously they leverage uh, AI methods as part of what they do. But it doesn't feel like any organization has yet made a, a stamp or claim to being like the AI company. And in some respects, it doesn't really feel like there are many obvious candidates for, for an organization that could be the next Google or Facebook or, or others. I'd love your thoughts on, is that something to do with, um, with the nature of the technology itself? Or is is just, you know, just wait, and uh, one of these organizations is going to emerge. Well, I think Google probably would uh, uh, disagree <laughs> with your assessment. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I've written a book about Google, and from the start, it considered itself an AI company. Um, you're right that no company has a utter dominance mm -hmm. in AI the way Meta slash Facebook has mm -hmm. in social media. Um, but uh, I think one reason why you couldn't say a company like a OpenAI has that sort of opportunity to do it is that you need an amazing infrastructure and unbelievable you know, computational resources in order to even pretend to go after dominance in that case. So that's why OpenAI had to partner with Microsoft because it has you know, uh, all these servers and, and as you were platform, um, and that's why you know, Google has to be seen as formidable because it's got 
its infrastructure, and uh, you know, Meta uh, is again has a lot, a lot of power there. Amazon, um, even though a company like Amazon uh, came a little late to pursuing AI, and then sort of got stuck on um, uh, where they were with Alexa, which you know uh, really didn't take advantage of the advances of the last few years, and when large language models became uh, popular, uh, they're sort of stuck in the, in the previous paradigm mm. with, with Alexa. Now that they have to work overtime to catch up. Mm. Well, I'm curious your thoughts on whether or not to become one of these defining companies. Really, it's about creating a defining experience. So Apple with the iPhone, or Google with the search engine, um, uh, Facebook, obviously, with the, with the Facebook app. And to a certain extent, the, the organizations who have come closest to, to leaving their mark on AI and being recognized this, when thinking of like, uh, um, AWS would have been with Alexa as an experience that us as consumers and um, everyday people would interact with, and arguably maybe that would be the, the reason why OpenAI is uh, uh, the closest it has come to being a defining AI company is that ChatGPT really created this ex wonderful experience that everybody w could work with. I'm wondering whether or not um, this is what we would be looking for in the company that would be the, the, the quote unquote AI company is to really nail that, um, that experience, that AI based user experience. Well, ChatGPT, I think, is a killer app uh, in the classic sense. <laughs> yes. Right? So you have to say, uh, but that's not where OpenAI's ambitions stop, right? They're a company which is chasing um, artificial general intelligence. And the chatbots are just one element of that. And if they pull that off first, then uh, the sky's the limit. Now, uh, they say they're structured to be a prof you know, profit-making organization for a while and switch to nonprofit. Um, and, you know, but uh, they're very competitive. And, you know, uh, and other companies have had to figure out how to align themselves um, as competitors, uh, Microsoft was very smart to partner with OpenAI, um, and that gave them relevance. And um, you know, Google is working very hard to take advantage of the resources it's built over the years. Uh, don't count out Apple because Apple, as you mentioned, is very consumer oriented, and whatever they come up with uh, is going to be based, as Siri was, on consumer behavior. So it, we're going to have a few fascinating years ahead of us. No, oh, absolutely. Uh, I guess I was curious when thinking about, say, your next book, whether mm. your next book would be about a, an AI company, or is it really going to be more like, to a certain extent, your, your prior company, your prior books have been about companies that weren't about the technology, they were about their use case, they were about what they, what they enabled for folks. And so, if, if, uh, in a few years down the road when you write your next book, will it be about an AI company, or is it more likely to be about, no, it's going to be about um, an, an incredible car company that uses artificial intelligence, an incredible robotics company that uses this for manufacturing or, or for something else? Well, I think the people who are building uh, AI uh, are fascinating even though themselves, and the, the mission is interesting. So, uh, you know, uh, I haven't committed to anything, but I'm certainly fascinated with that. Let's mm. leave it at that. Oh, excellent. Well, we're all looking forward to that, uh, to that book. Um, now, naturally, there are a lot of people who have a lot of concerns and worries when it comes to artificial intelligence, and you've written about um, regulation and the, the struggles with it. Uh, could you speak a little bit to um, what are our best options for ensuring that um, we minimize the, the negative use cases and, uh, of this technology? Well, I'm surprised in a good way about how active uh, governments and regulators are about uh, dealing with you know, uh, AI and, and its perils. Um, and they recognize that they want to uh, build these guardrails without um, hobbling AI so we get its, its benefits. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to thread the needle. There's going to be a lot of special interests piling in. But I think it's great that uh, people are settling at least on a shared set of principles 
um, in terms of transparency of training sets and um, anti-bias and making it clear when you're dealing with an AI and not. I think that gets increasingly hard as we use more and more AI and we won't be able to, to tell really ourselves whether you know, output is AI as we become more cyborgs uh, as we use the thing. Um, and then of course the, the guardrails to make sure it doesn't wipe us out. I think we have a little time before uh, we have to worry about that. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, have you noticed a, a trend towards uh, where we spoke about anthropomorphization when it comes to AI? And it's often felt to me when looking at ethical AI principles that they can be very anthropomorphized. When reading them, especially the early ones that came out um, five or six years ago, they looked like um, guidelines for human behavior uh, that were just uh, uh, switched out and you, you put AI instead of. And sometimes they could feel quite disconnected from the technological underpinnings, and indeed sometimes contradictory to the, the, the technological underpinnings. Is that, um, is that a worry, do you think, or is there, or, and have we moved beyond it? No, we haven't moved beyond it. I mean, you know, as we talked about earlier, um, uh, we still relate to these in the human sense because they appear uh, human because they speak our language. Um, you know, the Turing test is in shreds now because, you know, everyone has something uh, on their phone or computer uh, that aces any way you want to define the, the, the Turing test. But th this is not human intelligence. Um, it's intelligence in a different way. There's still things humans can do that uh, these models can hope to do, you know, uh, look how fast we've gotten to something that can write a complicated essay when it, we still can't uh, drive a car with confidence. It was something we thought 10 years ago uh, we'd be all doing right now. There'd be no more drivers. So um, uh, it is a different kind of intelligence, and we haven't begun to come to grips with that. Yes, and hopefully that, the fact that it's a different type of intelligence means that there's opportunities in the complementarity between human and artificial intelligence, or do you think we're on the path towards us being more, more substitutes than complements? Um, well, that's it. I, I've said that uh, the future is going to be a tug of war between co-pilot and an autopilot. <laughs> <laughs> That is a wonderful way of putting it. Stephen Levy, thank you very, very much for thank joining you. us. Um, Stephen Levy's book is um, Facebook, The Inside Story. Um, and please view uh, Stephen's um, keynote talk here at Rev4, um, which is available, will be available on demand. Thank you. Thank you so much.